evening, distinguished speakers, chairs, our revered father principal, respected vice principals, faculty members, and students. On behalf of the Postgraduate and Research Department of Economics, St. Xavier's College Autonomous Kolkata, I welcome you to the ICSSR ERC sponsored International Conference on Imperfect Resource Mobility and Economic Adjustments in a Changing World, celebrating 50 years of the specific factors model. St. Xavier's College Autonomous Kolkata was founded in 1860 by the Society of Jesus and was affiliated to the University of Calcutta in 1862. With a long and rewarding legacy of the Jesuits in education, our college community continues to move forward together with confidence, pride, and enthusiasm. Today, we remember the late Professor Ronald Winthrop Jones, a Professor Emeritus in the Department of Economics at the University of Rochester and a leading figure in the field of international economics. His demise on the 27th of September, 2022, is a huge loss for the global economics fraternity. A leading economist of his times, we celebrate his pioneering work on the specific factor model in this conference, 50 years since it was first introduced by him. In this session, we are going to hear from Professor M. Ali Khan, Professor Eric Bond, Professor Carlston Kowalczyk, and Professor Donald Davis, with each of the lectures being presided by eminent economists. We request our esteemed chairs to kindly allow a few selected questions from our students at the end of each lecture to help them gain a better understanding of the topic. We have in our midst our principal, Reverend Dr. Dominique Savio SJ, an economist Father Savio received his PhD in economics from the Burdwan University, India. His areas of interest being international economics, development economics, and econometrics. In his 23-year association with the college in various capacities, he has always been a source of encouragement for the students of this prestigious institution, and this department in particular. Every student entering the portals of St. Xavier's has benefited not only academically, but at large, holistically from this institution. It is a matter of great honor and privilege for me to welcome you, Father, on behalf of the Postgraduate and Research Department of Economics. I now request our revered Father Principal to kindly deliver the inaugural address. Thank you, Nirupama. Uh, welcome to all the delegates and all our professors and the students. A very good afternoon, very good morning, and a very good evening. It's a matter of great pride for the postgraduate and research department of economics of St. Javier's College Autonomous Kolkata to host an ICSSR ERC sponsored international conference on imperfect resource mobility and economic adjustments in a changing world, celebrating 50 years of the specific factor model. In collaboration with the IQAC, I extend my warm welcome to the eminent chairs, Professor Norich Sugu Nakanshi Nakanishi, Professor Sajal Lagiri, Professor Sogata Majit, Professor Ajitav Rai Choudhury, along with our distinguished speakers, Professor Mohammed Ali Khan, Professor Eric Bond, Professor Karsten Govalsik, and Professor Donald Davis. I further welcome the vice principals, deans, and heads of the departments of St. Javier's College Autonomous Kolkata, the faculty of the Postgraduate Research Department of Economics and our dear students. The field of international trade lost one of its giants. On 27th September 2022, the demise of Ronald Winthrop Jones. Dr. Jones was an influential trade economist and retired Xerox professor of economics 
at the University of Rochester. He has authored more than 180 articles, with his work having appeared in the profession's most prestigious journals. Starting with his PhD thesis, Jones made seminal contributions to the central competitive models of international trade, the Ricardian model, the Hexer-Oglin model, and the specific factor model. Ex works have received widespread appreciation. His highly acclaimed book, World Trade and Payments, co-authored with Richard E. Gaves and Jeffrey A. Frankel, is one of the leading undergraduate textbooks in trade. Much of Jones' work is summarized in his book, Globalization and Theory of Input Trade, in which he examined the recent tendency of firms to outsource parts of the production process to the areas of the globe. One of his best known works is The Structure of Simple General Equilibrium Models, published in the Journal of Political Economy article in 1965. The specific factor model was originally discussed by Jacob Winner, sometimes referred to as the Ricardo Winner model. The model was later developed and formalized mathematically by Ronald Jones in his landmark 1971 paper with a two good three factor interpretation. The model's name indicates its distinguishing feature that is, one factor of production is assumed to be specific to a particular industry. A factor may be immobile between industries for a number of reasons. The specific factor model thus demonstrates the effects of trade in an economy in which one factor of production is specific to an industry. In the simple sector specific model with the two sector specific factors and only one mobile factor, an increase in the price of one commodity increase the, the real return to the factor specific to its production in terms of the other specific factor. Thus, if capital and land are specific factors with labor as the only mobile factor, an increase in the price of the commodity using capital will increase the real rent on capital in terms of rent on land. Therefore, in the specific factors model, the conflict is between the land owners and capital owners. Real wage depends on the consumption pattern of the households. Jones and Sanyal's celebrated 1982 paper the theory of trade in middle products gave a formal structure to the literature on the trade in intermediate goods. Jones and Majid, in their 1985 paper, a simple production model with a Stobler Samuelson properties, provide a model with the simple properties in a Hecker-Ogling setting as well as a specific factor setting. There are some of his extraordinary contributions in the field, almost amongst numerous others. The theme for our conference is highly relevant as the global economy is back on the track with more dynamic and advanced technological processes. Following the pandemic, the specific factor model as formulated by Jones also completes 50 years. This international conference spread over three days starts with the online session today. Students will get the opportunity to listen to all the distinguished speakers from across the globe, share their valuable opinions and observations on Jones' work and advancements in trade theory. I hope that this international conference will be an academically stimulating event and I wish you all the very best in your endeavors. Thank you very much. May God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father, for your enlightening words. Our first lecture for today is on the Ricardo Viner Jones model.
Ronald W. Jones as a genuine equilibrium theorist in a classical mold. Chairing this lecture is Professor Noritsugu Nakanishi, and it will be delivered by Professor M. Ali Khan. Currently, Professor M. Ali Khan is the Abram Hutzler Professor of Political Economy at the Johns Hopkins University, a post that he has held since 1989. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, I would like to extend you a warm welcome, sir. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. This lecture is being chaired by Professor Noritsugu Nakanishi. Presently, the professor at the Graduate School of Economics, Kobe University, Japan. Professor Nakanishi has been associated with the Kobe University in various capacities since 1991. His research interests include international economics, both theory and policy, and game theory. Recipient of the Kojima Kiyoshi Prize of the Japan Society of International Economics in 2014, Professor Nakanishi has a wide variety of publications, from books to academic articles to his credit. The essence of international trade theory authored by him is a treasure for students and academics alike. Most recently, he has co-authored a book titled Virtual Trade and Comparative Advantage, The Fourth Dimension. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, thank you, Professor Nakanishi, for chairing this session. Without further ado, I call upon Professor Nakanishi to take this lecture forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction of me. So good evening in India and good uh, good evening in India and good morning in the US. So I'm Noritsugu Nakanishi uh, at the Graduate School of Economics, Kobe University, uh, speaking from Japan. Uh, it's a great honor and also a great pleasure to be for me to be here and serve as the chair of the first session of the Jones Memo Memorial Conference celebrating uh, the golden jubilee of his specific factor model article. I'm not a student of Professor Jones, uh, but uh, because uh, Professor Jones came to Kobe several times, and gave some lectures and uh, seminars in the last two decades, I quite fortunately had occasions to learn uh, the international trade theory directly from Professor Jones. Those uh, lectures and seminars uh, were really exciting. The last time I met Professor Jones uh, was uh, 2015 and the place was Kolkata. At that time, we gathered to, uh, to celebrate his famous General Equilibrium article. Today, we are getting together to celebrate his specific factor article. The place is, again, Kolkata. It's quite wonderful. Wonderful. So we are, I really appreciate the organizing committee of this conference. Now, let's start the first session. The speaker is Professor M. Ali Khan from Johns Hopkins University. The title is uh, Ricardo Viner Jones Model, uh, Ronald W. Jones as a General Equilibrium Theorist in a Classical Mode. Professor Khan, would you please take the platform and start your talk? Uh, thank you, Professor Nakanishi. And I assume that I can screen share. So let me just try it before I start speaking. So this is screen share. And now um, let me just go. And uh, so let me. Um, so I have two options. So let me just uh, uh, let me just start here. So. So can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I can see. I think it is visible, isn't it? Maybe a one or one. I recognize Shugato's voice. Uh, yes, so, yes, yes. 
<laughs> so good morning, good morning, Professor good morning. Ali Khan. Good yes, good morning. Let yes, I'm try. here. <laughs> I'm let here. Me try. Let me okay. try. So I oh, let me try on the PDF. Uh, so I open and uh, so let me just see. Uh, so I have documents and then I no, I I have to go to Dropbox. Then I go to uh, Khan Yuanik and I go to completed manuscripts. Then I go to continuity. Then I go to presentation. Then I go to Berkeley. And actually, I'm sorry to to give you a whole tour of my laptop, but uh, <laughs> uh, Jones talk. Okay, so now maybe this is better. Is this better? Yeah. <clears throat> and yes, maybe better. I. Yeah, it's okay. It's, yeah. It, it looks good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, let me just. Uh, it's two hundred and four. So let me make it one twenty five. And now cancel. This is. You see, I'm not that. Okay. Okay. So maybe. Uh, yeah. So. Let's put this here. Uh, please make it a little bit larger. I see. Okay. So. Uh, I make it one. Okay. This is better, Good. I think. Yeah. Better. Okay. Great. So let me, uh, and now, uh, Professor Nakanishi, how much? I have uh, uh, 35 minutes. Uh, I, I think you have, uh, you have 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Very good. 30. Very good. So, uh, so, uh, uh, let me let me return your greetings. Uh, I uh, have never been to Kobe, but I have been many times to Japan, so I am delighted to meet you. Uh, but let me begin by Father Dominic Savio. I hope I am not mispronouncing your name. Thank you for organizing this conference, and thank you for your uh, um, for your introduction to Ron Jones, and to of course Dr. Banerjee and to Dr. Paul. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Nakanishi said that uh, uh, um, he is not a student of Ron Jones, and neither am I. And I am also, I have never been a colleague formally of Ron Jones. Um, but of course, in some sense, because of my interest in international trade theory, they were really interests of the past. But my also interest in general equilibrium theory. Uh, uh, we are all his students. I am his student. In that sense, I am his student. So the conference, the title of the conference is in two phrases, imperfect resource mobility and economic adjustments in a changing world. So I flag mobility and I flag adjustment. They are dynamic words. And I flag changing. So the title has a lot of dynamism in it. But that's part of the title. The second part is celebrating 50 years of the specific factor model. So already we put two ideas together. Two concepts together. The concept of dynamics and the concept of a static model. So that's my first, first take. But my second take is, what am I to speak in this half hour? What would be appropriate for this half hour of celebration of the specific factors model? And by virtue of Ron's passing, a celebration of his life and career as an international economist. 
So I have been nonplussed. And I began, I said I was neither friend nor, uh, nor uh, colleague. I mean, I beg your pardon, that was a Freudian slip. I said, I'm neither, uh, I have neither been formally a student and a formally a colleague. Informally, of course, I am student, colleague. But I have been privileged in a way that I am still trying to come to terms with by his friendship. And so in a sense, this is what we in the subcontinent know well. A sweet occasion tinged with some sorrow. Life comes in this way. So let me begin. And please be patient. I begin with Ron Jones's AEA 2009 citation. When he was elected distinguished fellow. Ronald Jones makes the few equations deliver profound insights. Keynes all in, tariffs, flows, incidents, the right set of equations to capture the essence of a resource allocation problem without unnecessary clutter. So there is the elegance. There is the general equilibrium theorist. There is the classical mode. Citation continued. Few papers have had as much influence on a field. Simple general equilibrium models. Hector Olin Samuelson model. Specific factors model. Comparative statics. Log differentiation. Now, log differentiation is a problem. It's not a problem, but it could be substituted. It could be substituted by Ron's contribution encapsulated in the phrase the hat calculus. He used the hat calculus to spectacular advantage. Citation continued. General equilibrium interactions, comfortable and familiar, lay bare the structure of familiar, the word familiar, cross country differences. Greatly clarified. Remember, this is an official statement. This is not just some colloquial after dinner drink reminiscence of people who are fans of Ronald Jones. This is an official citation of the American Economic Association. Extensions to non-traded goods, distorted factor markets. I am going to flag this if I may. Let's see. Variable factor supplies and variable returns to scale. I'll flag this if I may. To name just a few. Yes, to name just a few. And to the extent that my slides, as you will see, are blemished, I simply could not finish. There is so much. I began one week ago. I said, oh, I know Ron's work. I'm his student. But I am still struggling. And I speak to you from my basement. This is a joy of internet communication. And I still have my notes. And there is an important item which I still could not put on the slides. And I have Paul Samuelson's papers all strewn about me. So to name just a few. This man lived international trade theory. Let's continue. Only 
only final goods are tradable. He relaxed this assumption. This is the non-traded goods. That's how, that was the first time I got to know of him as an undergraduate uh, through Harry Johnson at the London School of Economics. Ron would come often to the London School of Economics. And the seminar that he was going giving was on non-traded goods. Characteristic elegance and clarity. This is modern work. But this is the punchline. This is the Ricardian punchline. Absolute rather than comparative advance. He practices what he preaches. Comparative advantage. Rarely does he venture into perfect, imperfect competition or imperfect information. This is important. Let me flag them. Roy Radner also just passed away. So information is on our minds. And even less frequently into empirical research. But what he does, he has done for more than 50 years. This 2009, I remind you. And he has done it superbly. Small scale general equilibrium models are his milieu. No question receives a cleaner or more incisive treatment than this in his capable hands. And now we have an adjective to general equilibrium theory in the classical mode. And that adjective is small scale. This will play a very large role as we move forward. Uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Nakanishi, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt if there are any questions and uh, lack of clarification. But now I finished the, the citation. So let me continue. Let me continue with what Jones wrote on Kindleberger in 2005, four years before he became fellow. Charlie will be missed, but he leaves behind an important legacy. Boundless energy and enthusiasm. I knew Ron's boundless energy and enthusiasm. He serves as an important role model. To the legion of his former students, it would be in bad taste to name them. But I noticed that on one of those documents, on, which are available on the internet, he names Eric Bond and he names Makoto Yano. These are the only two he names. Excitement about economics and his warmth to them personally, extended from student days to subsequent decades. He was a unique man, and it is our privilege to honor him today. The French poet Valery said, All theory is autobiography. I don't know about all theory, but certainly when we see and praise our role models. In some sense, we try to talk about what aspires us and therefore what is in its embryonic state already in us. And there you have it. There you have it. Who, is, who are we speaking and honoring today? Charlie Kindleberger or Ronald Jones? So an overview of the oeuvre, the style and the signature. An economist of his time, of his time. A student of Stolper and Samuelson, a theorist, a geometrician, an intellectual historian, a teacher. Why am I putting this? You know this. But Father, Dominic also mentioned students. We are all students of Ron Jones. So outline of the talk. I have already taken Professor Nakanishi 15 minutes. So I will take 15 more. 
So what it is not? It is not some deep mathematical result. I don't have such a result. I'm getting old too. A contribution to the technical register. And some big idea. I don't have any big idea in this talk. A contribution to the substantive register. I would like to hope it is not a spasm of self-absorption and self-advertisement. That I am not really talking about myself. In this case, there is no fear. I cannot. And I hope it's not a series of name droppings, anecdotes and reminiscences. We've had a couple. I have an obituary on the SAET website. And then there have been just very moving meetings already um, in Rochester and elsewhere. So, Okay, so there's a first blemish, a typo. What it is, it is an attempt to, at answers to the following. Who is Ron Jones? What does the name connote for the subject of international economics? How is his name a proxy for the economics profession of his time? So if this is if there's any merit in this talk, it is to evoke the economics profession of his time along with honoring his legacy. In short, to emphasize retrieval rather than recruitment. I don't want to use his name to give authority to what I want to do or to give authority to what I think are the problems of economic adjustments and imperfect resource mobility in a changing world of our times. Of course, his work is going to be relevant. This whole conference is a testimony to that. But who was Ron Jones? And how is his name a proxy for the economics profession of his time? Some intellectual connections. I have been, I keep emphasizing, I am not formally his student, not formally his colleague. If anything, I am just a friend. But there are three items where he took note of me. Item 97 on his May 2018 is important because he was a discussant of a paper that was never written at the time that he was discussing it. And this was a source of amusement and joke to him in all our subsequent meetings. The other two are papers, one with Professor Marjith, who's here, and the other, again, this another blemish. Uh, I think this is a paper with Mitra, but I forget the late Tapan Mitra, the great late Tapan Mitra, where they took cognizance of a paper of mine. So the, the, this paper, so on my CV, uh, this paper was finally written after his discussion. So it, it incorporated his discussion. And then I discussed his paper where I compared him. So in some sense, this talk is comparing incomparables. I compared him not only to Gerard Debreau. That's my first step in the classical mold but also with a great art critic and historian of art, my colleague, Michael Fried. And this is the paper, the only paper, the only paper that he quoted in his 180, 180 publications. Of course, the earlier ones I never, I, I got onto the scene. In that sense, I will correct Professor Banerjee. Um, uh, my, uh, my career begins at Hopkins in 1973. So it's 50-year career. So let's get to work. This is the first benchmark. Heksha Rowling Samuelson. It was called the Heksha Rowling model. 
the referee objected in my 1980 paper on the Harris-Todaro hypothesis at the title Heckscher Olin Samuelson and I had to fight it. But Ron uses it now easily. This is the other. And I added Samuelson's name or I was one of the few who added Samuelson's name early on. I now use this conference to add his name to the Ricardo Weiner model. It is indeed the Ricardo Weiner Jones's benchmark. Let me hurry. Some followers. So this is blemish number one. I have to fill in a lot of uh, work here. But you know, we all have this search engines. So you can fill this in yourself. But this is an important paper. I have it now on the screen. But it's three years later. And it quotes Ron's paper. The Ron's paper which you use as a title for your conference. Theory, history and trade. Ah, let's move on. The Ricardo Weiner Jones's model. Two titles on an important date. Ronald Jones, a paper which was rejected by the professional journals. And it's in honor of a volume for Charles Lee Kindleberger and Paul Samuelson's great paper. Both are great papers. Olin was right. Ah, but the Stolper Samuelson paper. The golden anniversary and the history of an idea. So like I say, I have this book on international trade and competitive models, which are a collection of his essays in 2018. He had earlier done a volume for North Poland. And I was stunned that out of the 19 chapters, I only knew two. So there's a lot of work to be done. But this paper is there in that volume. Ron Jones on the Stolper Samuelson theorem. I'll be quick. He did a lot of work on the Stolper Samuelson theorem. And if I had the courage, I would call it the Stolper Samuelson Jones theorem. But let's not continue. A lot of work on the Stolper Samuelson theorem. Just Stolper Samuelson in the titles. Okay, I, you see this another blemish. I have to do the Jones Shankman paper. Lot of work on Stolper Samuelson. Lot of work on Stolper, Stolper Samuelson. Incidentally, this 1969 essay and uh, issue is a very celebrated issue. Not only for the Stolper Samuelson theorem, but also for a variety of other results. And I had it on the on the screen, but I would recommend you look at this volume 10. The students look at this volume 10. The Japanese contribution. Ron loved Japan. Lionel McKenzie loved Japan. Lionel McKenzie's library is in Kyoto. So the Japanese contribution. He was a close friend of Ekawa. He would always laugh and say, and I hope I'm not saying anything politically incorrect. He would laugh and re refer to Ekawa as a kamakazi pilot who came to work on, uh, on the Stolper Samuelson theorem. And there is this great econometrica paper, Kenishi Inada. So a very important Japanese contribution to Rochester, to international trade theory, hmm? and to economics. Inada is, I could go on about Inada. I could go on about Wekawa. Japanese contribution continued. Okamoto. Shimomura, beautiful paper, 1997, Shimomura. The geometric approach, I go back, I go back to the title. Okay, so now I have more and I don't know why I am not being, why it didn't come out because I have more. So, 
So let me just see. So we are talking about Ron Jones. That's what the talk is. I have five more minutes. And then I gave you all of these. Student, theorist, geometrician. These are all from his paper, artworks, artworks. Intellectual historian, a teacher and inspiration. So a teacher. So I did all of this. I don't understand. I don't understand. Uh, the Japanese contribution. Just one second. Okay, so that's it. So that that's the that's the thing. So now I want to go back and I want to use this five minutes not to screen share but to speak to you. And I will now get here. So this topic of general equilibrium theorist in the classical mode on the classical mold. Mm -hmm. I want to end with two points. First, his focus on these two models and how his entire, the, this whole oeuvre can be looked at through these windows. And his text, which I have used when I taught courses in uh, in undergraduate international trade at Hop Hopkins. I've always used Caves and Jones and the classical treatment has been uh, uh, through this. Uh, Ricardo, what he would call two by one, Ricardo Weiner, two by three, and Heckscher Olin Samuelson, two by two. So that's a focus. But there have been omissions. And I already singled out for you the 1970. I singled out for you 1971 as a year of importance for international trade theory. That's where the specific factors model was put forward. Of course, there are precursors, but that's the paper for his, that's the year of his paper in trade theory and history. And Samuelson's 1971 paper, which I went back to, and uh, I need to go back to it in more detail. But there was a 1965 paper, and that's his famous general equilibrium paper. That he publishes, that he reprints in his 2018 volume. And one of the blemishes in my slide on the interconnections of the CVs, the meeting of the CVs, is that in 19, in 2006, I wrote a tribute in addition and that item is meeting, missing. And that is with a Japanese economist, Minako Fujio of Yokohama. And there we read, we read 1965 paper. And so why am I bringing up in my last two concluding points. I'm bringing it up because that reading pointed to what I would now call three omissions on his, in his view of economics. And one was his staying with static models by and large. There are experts here who will correct me. But really, he got into growth theory or in economic dynamics as understood by Samuelson in his 1965 General Equilibrium Theory paper, where he has the capital stock increasing. And there's a nice tale which can go on this. But after that, he never touched economic dynamics and growth theory again. I know that these the word never is a very dangerous word because it shows um, 
some lack of doubt. The research and our communication is nothing but doubt. But nevertheless, I would like to put this as a claim on the table. He avoided dynamics. Ron Jones avoided dynamics. And now a puzzle. The second thing. In this 2018 volume, he does not refer to another classical paper. A paper on which when I was called to teach trade at Northwestern in 1978 and I replied, but I have never done trade. And John Ledier told me, then this is the occasion to learn to do trade. And one of the papers on which I cut my teeth also in 1971. And that is his famous distortions paper with perverse supply schedules and which gave rise to work of Neary and so on. So in a sense, when I talk of the interconnections of CVs, there is also a hurt. Hurt is too strong. There is a complaint. I never made it to him personally, but I make it now. He ignored all the little work that I had done on the harris todaro hypothesis with a clear determination. He never touched the Bhagwati, uh, Srinivasan, Harry Johnson. He was so influenced by Bhagwati, Srinivasan and Harry Johnson. And he never touched, uh, touched the theory of distortion in his 2018 collection of essays. So there, is a, there are silences in this 2018 collection. There's growth and dynamics, which is there. There is silence on distortions. And there is silence on public goods. Ron never touched public goods. So let me conclude by just showing you the final photographs. And this is this explicit embeddedness. And this is the theory of distortion. So Bhagwati, Harry Johnson, Srinivasan. I couldn't get Ramaswamy's photograph, but that belongs here along with Japan, Ron loved India. So, Father Dominique Savio, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Paul, and Professor Nakanishi, I thank you for giving this opportunity to me. I am delighted to have talked to you. And most importantly, I hope that from this communication, I will be able to work with more enthusiasm and keep his legacy alive. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Khans. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your very, very enthusiastic uh, talk. But so, uh, I'm afraid we are short of time. So I, you, uh, we have to go on to the next, next session, I guess. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nakanishi, for chairing that lecture. And thank you, uh, and thank you, Professor Khan, for summing up late Professor Jones' vast lifetime of work so perfectly. Our second lecture is on pandemics and trade policy. Chairing this lecture is Professor Shojo Lahiri, and it will be delivered by Professor Eric Bond. Professor Eric Bond is currently the Joe Robbie Professor of Economics at Vanderbilt University, a position he has held since 2003. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, I would like to extend you a warm welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with your presence. This lecture is being chaired by Professor Shojol Lahiri. Our esteemed chair, Professor Shojol Lahiri, is currently a professor of economics at the Southern Illinois University. He was awarded his PhD by the Indian Statistical Institute in 1977 and has previously worked at the University of Essex in England before joining the faculty at the Southern Illinois University in 2002 as the Vanderveer Endowed Chair in Economics. Professor Lahiri has written extensively on issues related to international economics and development economics. 
He has worked as a consultant to international organizations like the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Food and Agricultural Organization, and the World Bank. Professor Lahiri has also chaired over 50 PhD dissertations. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, thank you, Professor Lahiri, for chairing this lecture. May I now invite you, sir, to take this lecture forward. Thank you, Nirupama. Uh, yeah. Now, my, I had some little bit of problem with my laptop. Uh, my uh, The webcam isn't working, so I'm using the phone, the cell phone. So one danger of that is that the phone may ring, and it, the, my ringtone is uh, my six-year-old grand, granddaughter, Tia, saying, you are gorgeous. So you might hear, uh, you can hear her say that in the middle sometime. <laughs> but uh, I sort of apologize well in advance for it. Uh, uh, Ron Jones, I like uh, Ali Khan. Uh, I actually was never taught by him, but he always considered me to be a honorary Rochesterian and I got his uh, uh, love and everything. That's because of my friendship with many Rochester students and in particular, my brother Kajal, who is also here, uh, who was, of course, a, a graduate from uh, Rochester University. Now, the today's speaker, Eric Bond, I know for a long, long time. Eric Bond, as he's known as. Um, we have something in common in the sense that we moved our jobs. We went to our respective bend out chairs around the same time, about 20 years ago. He moved to uh, Vanderbilt and I moved to Southern Illinois. And we have physicist sons, uh, respectively, and there are some similarities. And we possibly roughly in the same age group. Now, Rick, as it was said a little bit uh, earlier, that he holds a very a prestigious endowed chair at Vanderbilt. Uh, but his publication, Rick, is absolutely outstanding. He has published in almost all the top journals in economics, AR, Journal of Political Economy, Journal of Journal of Economic Theory, Review of Economic Studies, Journal of Internet Economics, and so on, and large number of them. So, um, and, uh, and he also has two sides. One is uh, uh, international trade theory and policy, but he's also a theorist, economic theorist. He has uh, written lots of papers on sort of pure theory and uh, applied microeconomics. And today's topic, I hope uh, I can have sense what he's going to talk about pandemic and trade policy, possibly a little bit more broadly speaking, uh, trade policy during some times of crisis. And uh, there is always a tendency to have protectionist trade policies. And I'm sure we'll hear from him uh, about it. So I'll uh, hand over uh, the stage to Rick. And uh, he will have about half an hour, right? Half an hour to speak. Okay. Over to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Sajil. Uh, there we go. Everybody see that? Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, uh, present at this conference. Uh, the specific factor model has had a, a big influence on my work and my thinking about a variety of uh, uh, economic policy issues. So it's uh, uh, a pleasure to be able to participate today. Uh, I'm gonna focus on an aspect of the specific factors model, uh, which has to do with its relationship to political economy models. Uh, because the specific factor model has really become the workhorse model uh, for thinking about the political economy of, of trade policy. The magnification effect for the specific factor whose, whose price increases provides incentive to, to seek protection for specific factors, uh, more so than for the mobile factors, uh, whose benefits will be somewhat diminished by inflows of, of, of factors. But it also creates a negative effect on other sectors uh, who are potential uh, uh, rivals in politics uh, to, for, to demands for protection. 
But the, these negative effects on the other sectors dissipate as the number of other sectors rises, uh, a point that Ron uh, described as the importance of being unimportant. Uh, so that as the elasticity of that labor supply to your sector uh, becomes infinitely large, uh, you don't hurt anybody else uh, by demanding protection uh, and therefore uh, uh, have a high return to that. Now, that specific factor model can be combined with a, a model of sector-specific lobbying uh, to obtain a weighted social welfare function uh, that can be used as a government objective function, uh, and an example being the protection for sale model uh, of Grossman and Helpman. And so my starting point today is going to be this welfare, a sectoral welfare function, uh, where we've assumed that there's a, a sector with, with constant returns to scale and mobile factor, uh, which sort of pins down the wage. Uh, so we can think about sector specific payoffs uh, and the return to protection in a particular sector. So the sectoral welfare for sector I is going to be a weighted sum of consumer surplus, which is my S function, uh, the return to the sector specific factor, the pi function, and then the tariff revenue uh, generated by that uh, sector. Uh, the weight, the alpha here is a weight on uh, uh, the consumer surplus. The beta, beta is the weight on uh, uh, the sectoral interest group. And what's typically done with these models is uh, to assume that consumers are not organized uh, and therefore their weight is one sort of similar to the tariff revenue, but the action in political economy comes from uh, the influence of these sector specific factors, in particular those that are organized to seek uh, protection. And so this generates a theory of uh, the optimal tariff or the politically optimal tariff which is gonna depend on a sum of the market power effects, uh, which work through the tariff revenue term and the, uh, the gains from transferring income to the sector specific factors uh, as reflected in the, the magnitude of the beta term. And the work of Bagwell and Steger has sort of emphasized that trade agreements uh, are, can be thought of as agreements to neutralize these market power effects. Uh, so that uh, uh, trade agreements can still have some tariffs reflecting uh, political effects, but the terms of trade spillovers will be eliminated by these agreements. Uh, so in the, with the theme of the conference being changing world, um, what I wanna talk about today is how, how is how do we think about the role of pandemics as they, as they relate to trade policy and to trade agreements. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the impact on the politically optimal tariff uh, and how should a trade agreement deal with the possibility uh, of a pandemic shock. Uh, and, and this relates to uh, some work that I've done in the past, looking at the effect of state contingent political shocks, uh, which create a demand for flexibility and trade agreements. So uh, when particular groups start lobbying, uh, so for example, the steel industry uh, in the early 2000s in the US, um, demanding protection, um, trade agreements have to take into account uh, or how, how do you deal with uh, shocks to the trading system, uh, which are going to uh, uh, change the demand for protection and therefore uh, what kinds of adjustment we allow in trade policy uh, in response to, the, to these types of shocks, okay? And uh, this work, uh, which I've done with Mustafa Beshkar is, is focused on uh, the role of tariff bindings, uh, tariff overhang and uh, safeguards as providing mechanisms for uh, response to uh, shocks or forms of, of flexibility built into the trade system, sort of state contingent uh, trade policies. So that brings me to the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and I'm going to give you some stylized facts 
of how trade policy has responded to uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. So between January uh, 2020 and December 2021, there are more than 700 trade policy actions in medical goods. Uh, in contrast to the standard trade war, not all of these, these uh, trade actions are trade restrictive. So the policies affecting exports were overwhelmingly restrictive while import policies were primarily liberalizing. And so here's a summary. Uh, if you look at the import policies, uh, you can see the, uh, the, the, liberali the uh, liberalizing trade of import policies outnumber uh, the restrictive policies by more than three to one. And uh, the export policies, restrictive policies out, out uh, weigh uh, liberalizing policies by more than 10 to one. And if we look at the implementation of these restrictions by their timing, uh, you can see that there's a huge uh, response in terms of the number of restrictive export policies uh, around the time of the first awareness of the, uh, the COVID outbreak and uh, subsequent blips uh, associated with the Delta variant. Uh, the same applies to the uh, liberalizing import policies. And another interesting fact about this is that if you look at uh, what's happening with food policy, uh, these actions follow uh, a similar pattern, not quite as stark as with the uh, medical goods, uh, but we have a significant uh, number of import liberalizing policies uh, in food, food relative and uh, export policies, uh, they tend to be restrictive. Um, and the timing of these policies, uh, again, corresponds with those uh, for medical goods. So how did the WTO deal with this? Are these, with this uh, COVID uh, type trade war, as it were, uh, compatible with the WTO. So we have tariff reductions. Those are consistent with tariff bindings. There's no problem with, with lowering your tariffs to be more liberalizing. Uh, the WTO tends not to uh, restrict export policies. Uh, and as a result, uh, there really, there were no uh, disputes uh, filed at the WTO in, in response to uh, COVID trade policies. But at the same time, the WTO was quite concerned about the fact that these trade restrictions were taking place and were disrupting the flow uh, of medical goods and preventing the export of uh, PPE and other important uh, products uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, but their main uh, response would be put in the category of moral suasion and emphasizing transparency. Uh, report your policies that you put in place, uh, but the WTO really didn't have a lot of uh, enforcement power. Okay. So what I do in this paper is to uh, think about how we model a, a pandemic shock and how it relates to uh, optimal trade policy and how uh, an efficient trade agreement, uh, what an efficient trade agreement would look like uh, with the potential for a pandemic shock. And the idea here is that a pandemic is going to be both an economic shock and a political shock. And so there are going to be different states of the world, which I'll divide simply into a safe, safe state S and a pandemic state P. In the uh, pandemic state, consumer demands are shifted toward essential goods for the pandemic. So there's a subset of goods which we can think of as essential goods, uh, masks, uh, uh, ventilators, et cetera, uh, and potentially also a restriction in supply uh, due to lockdowns. 
the allocation of capital investment to these pandemic goods relative to other goods uh, occurs prior to the realization of the state. Okay, so your investment in, in the capital, the sector specific capital uh, is, is fixed uh, before we realize the state of the world. And the key argument, the main argument I'm gonna make is that prices of pandemic goods uh, become more salient to consumers. Uh, and even though uh, consumers are not necessarily organized, uh, politicians and, and democracies recognize that failure to deal uh, effectively with a pandemic uh, is likely to get them booted out of office uh, or in a dictatorship, people are likely to be out in the streets uh, in response to very high prices for uh, masks and food. Uh, and therefore, uh, preferences of the government are going, going to shift. And effectively, what I'm going to introduce is that alpha weight on consumer surplus uh, is now going to be moving around in the pandemic state relative to what it is in the safe state. Okay. So if we look at the optimal trade tax for country I and state J, and country one here is gonna be the exporter of the pandemic uh, essential good, uh, and country two is the importer, uh, then we get this uh, optimal tariff formula, which has three terms. And it's important to keep in mind here that tau is gonna be positive for an import tariff and negative for an export tax. Okay, so the first term is the traditional uh, inverse supply, uh, uh, inverse elasticity of export supply for the import good. Uh, that's going to be positive for the importing country, uh, and it's going to be negative for the exporting country, which is going to mean that the importing country is going to want to impose a tariff, uh, and the exporting country uh, and uh, an export tax. Uh, the second term is the uh, political economy on the producer side. So when beta is greater than one, uh, you're gonna get an additional uh, tariff incentive resulting from the fact that uh, you're, you've got lobbying to influence the policy. Uh, and the final term, uh, and, and that will work against the export tax uh, uh, for the, the exporters. And then finally, you've got the uh, alpha term here reflecting the consumer interests, and that will tend to uh, reduce the, the optimal tariff when alpha is bigger than one, and it will raise the optimal export tax uh, when alpha is uh, greater than one for the uh, uh, pandemic supply of goods. Okay, so the increase in alpha re results in more restrictive trade policies for exporters and more liberalization for importers as as the stylized facts uh, that I put up there suggest. Now you might also ask, well, can we also, you know, can we explain this in the, the sort of standard way uh, with a market power explanation? Uh, so the market power explanation would work if demand shifts cause market power of the importer to fall and the exporter to rise. That would be consistent with what we're seeing with these trade policies. Uh, and so to, to look at the role of that argument, I took two simple examples uh, of excess demand shifts with linear excess demand functions. And the key here is that these shocks are hitting both exporter and importer at the same time. So my first shock is one where uh, in the pandemic state, uh, the uh, intercept of the excess demand curve uh, increases. So you've got uh, uh, an increase in the demand and a reduction in, in the export supply. Uh, and it turns out with linear demands, the Nash equilibrium trade taxes are independent of the level uh, of this shock. Uh, the other example I used was one where uh, the export supply shifts down proportionally and import demand shifts up proportionally. Uh, and in that case, the Nash equilibrium export taxes uh, are, are declining in the shock 
and the tariff uh, of the importing countries increasing in the shock. Uh, so neither of these uh, seems to fit the pattern that we see uh, in the data. Um, and uh, also you know, maybe more strongly, um, a, lot, a lot of these export restriction policies took the form of uh, bans on exports, uh, would, which would never happen in, a, in, a, in an optimal uh, export tax framework because you, uh, you lose the terms of trade gains once the, the flow of goods is, is shut off. So the question then is, you know, how do we think about uh, what, what would a, an efficient trade agreement uh, do uh, in this sort of situation? And to, to look at this, I model it in a way that's been uh, frequently used in this literature, which is to uh, think of trade agreements as maximizing the sum of uh, country welfare functions, taking into account the political effects. So the idea is here that, that uh, the negotiators get together and, and they're uh, negotiating, uh, ref their negotiations reflect the political influences of importers and, and potentially the consumer, or, I'm sorry, of, of uh, import competing sectors and producers and uh, consumers as well. Uh, so the assumptions here are that we can make uh, ex ante transfers between government between countries uh, so that there's th these are all individually rational to participate. Um, tariffs are allowed here to be state contingent. Uh, the assumption being that government preferences here are going to be observable to all. Uh, and so the question then is, um, and, and the assumption here is the agreement is enforceable. So I'm going to abstract from uh, self-enforcement requirements. Now, if you look at a trade agreement in this setting, uh, optimal dom domestic prices uh, are going to satisfy the price differential uh, between the uh, good and the uh, exporting country and the importing country is going to reflect differences in the consumer preferences and the uh, uh, and the producer interests uh, because the terms of trade effects are going to be eliminated in a uh, an agreement, uh, an efficient agreement uh, in each state of the world. Uh, the interesting feature of this is that. Um, well, so there's going to be no trade distortion uh, if if these uh, political weights of consumers and producers are, are similar between the countries. Uh, but the uh, interesting point here is that uh, individual tax rates here are not uniquely determined. And the reason is that the export tax plus the import tariff effectively creates a an income transfer between the countries. So the failure to um, limit export policies is going to mean that there's going to be sort of an indeterminacy in this state of the world uh, as to uh, how uh, the effects of, of the trade policy are distributed between the countries. Uh, and so you need some sort of additional bargaining uh, in order to pin down uh, uh, the outcome here. Uh, which, which you know, you might think of as being related to uh, uh, the issues that the uh, the WTO uh, dealt with. Uh, if we take a step back, uh, we can also take think about uh, how how capital owners behave here uh, when they set their uh, investments uh, to maximize expected returns across states. Uh, so Thj here represents the the probability of of a state J, a safe state or a pandemic state. And the reduced consumer prices in the pandemic state are going to create a disincentive to invest in in these pandemic related goods. And if we solve for the uh, terms of trade effects, 
uh, resulting from uh, the increment of capital, you can see that from the national point of view, uh, the investments, uh, their impact uh, arise through um, the impact on the profits of the sector-specific factors and the impacts on the terms of trade uh, resulting from the increment uh, of capital. And so one question is sort of how, did, how would uh, a trade agreement deal with uh, these ex ante uh, investment issues because, because of this fact that if you recognize in, this, in the pandemic state of the world that you're going to get these restrictive policies that are gonna drive down uh, consumer prices, uh, you're going to end up with um, uh, underinvestment in goods related to the pandemic. If we look at this from the point of view of a social planner maximizing uh, the welfare function of the two countries, what you'd want to do is you'd want to equate producer prices across countries in the pandemic state. So consumer uh, prices uh, would reflect differences in the weights uh, of the two countries. And so the return to capital in the pandemic state reflects the private value. And so this planner's problem can be implemented using uh, consumption subsidies uh, in each country. Uh, so to wrap up here, um, the pandemic state trade policy reactions are consistent with uh, a government payoff function that puts greater weight on consumption in the pandemic state. Uh, and I think it's um, this point about the, um, you know, the, the fact that certain states of the world can cause policies to be more uh, salient to consumers and therefore cause their weights to uh, uh, work against those of the uh, organized special interests uh, is, is important. Uh, current WTO rules put little restriction on the types of trade policy uh, uh, actions observed during the pandemic. And the problem is that the use of policies to drive down prices of pandemic goods in each country uh, are, when there are trade taxes, are, are reducing this incentive to invest in capital to produce these goods. And so the WTO should encourage, I think, the use of consumption subsidies rather than taxes uh, to deal with um, pandemic shocks uh, and also uh, coordination of investments uh, in, in pandemic capital uh, would, would also be be useful uh, because here we've taken in thinking about this agreement, uh, I've taken the investments uh, as, as predetermined uh, and uh, potentially an agreement which uh, took those uh, uh, into account uh, would, would lead to further uh, welfare improvements. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh yeah, and just sort of let me just uh, one additional comment. And, and um, yeah, I just like to say that I think the, you know, the, the use here of the specific factor model uh, in, has been very helpful in, in thinking about uh, these political economy issues and the design of trade agreements. Uh, and uh, we're sort of taking, taking Ron's work on that. Uh, uh, into into new new areas uh, of of analysis. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions. Sahil and uh, Nirupam, uh, how are you doing with respect to time? Do we have a few minutes for questions? Uh, yes, sir. We can allow for one question. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. Um, Yes, sir. 
is there any question can you sort of put the question in the chat possibly that would be easier then yeah. i have no question but a comment this is fascinating i never thought it would have such direct relevance to the covid problem i mean it's fascinating Any other comment or remark? Okay, in that case, uh, okay. thank you very much, Rick, uh, for the wonderful, wonderful talk. And now I hand over the stage to the next speaker, the next talk. Yes, yeah, so I think we have a question. Um, okay, okay, you have a question. Um, I think we have a question from Ananya Mukherjee. Uh, with your permission, I'd require at uh, sure, sure, sure. To allow her to ask the question. Yes, sure. Ananya. Yes, should I ask the question? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, so, so prior to pandemic, after the global financial crisis, 2008-2009, uh, uh, trade was disrupted. Also, trade war between US-China obstacle trade. Outbreak of pandemic jolted trade again. Given these three different types of trade shocks, what policies are necessary to resurrect trade after the pandemic? Will deglobalization set in and how? supply chain could be revised. Are all these three shocks essentially different in terms of trade disruptions? Um, so, I, I mean, the trade war, uh, I think is a very different uh, issue in the sense that, uh, you know, this is sort of uh, questioning the uh, future persistence of the trade agreement, it's, uh, the, tr the WTO itself, right? Because we're at a point where potentially countries will, will sort of abandon uh, dispute settlement uh, and also, um, you know, engage in more voluntary export restraints, which we've worked out of. Uh, uh, so in thinking about that, um, I would uh, assume, I would work in an environment where I did not have the commitment element and think about things which would be uh, allow this agreement to be self-enforcing uh, and, and how you would sustain an agreement going forward uh, given, those, given those shocks. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, as opposed to, uh, well, I, I do feel, however, that I, I guess that part of the reason for the trade war is, uh, sort of a, a failure of some of the flexibility mechanisms within the trade agreement itself, particularly safeguards. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the dispute settlement body pretty much has prevented any sort of safeguard actions uh, among leading uh, industrialized countries has, has uh, I think, um, made it difficult to respond to political pressure and sort of pushed in the direction of, of the Trump uh, uh, tariffs. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Another question. Okay, okay, Shahil, uh, over to you. Thank you, Professor Lahiri and Professor Bond for that enlightening session. Moving on, our next lecture is on the specific factor model, a user-friendly approach to interest and policy to be delivered by Professor Carl Austin Walzik. This lecture will be chaired by Professor Shugoto Marji. Presently serving as Associate Professor of International Economics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University, Professor Koalzik is also an Honorary Professor at the Arvis University. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, thank you for this lecture, Professor Koalzik. This lecture is being chaired by Professor Shugoto Marji. Professor Shugoto Marjit is the first distinguished professor of the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. He was the RPI Professor of Industrial Economics and Director at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Kolkata, and the first Shukumai Chakraborty Professor 
at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Formerly, he was also the Vice Chancellor of the University of Calcutta, mentored by Professor Jones himself at the University of Rochester, where Marjit had known him closely, and it is therefore all the more befitting to have him chair this lecture with more than 150 papers in leading journals, including the American Economic Review, the European Economic Review, and the Journal of Development Economics, among others. Most recently, he was awarded the prestigious A.L. Nagar Award by the Indian Econometric Society, and has also been a recipient of several awards and honors, including the Mahalo Nobis Gold Medal, and the VKRV Rao National Prize as a young social scientist. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, I extend a warm welcome to you and Professor Kowalczyk. Thank you for this lecture. I would now like to invite Professor Marjit to take this lecture forward. Thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, also welcome to all of uh, friends and colleagues from outside India who are, who are participating today. And of course, uh, Karsten, I think some of you know, but I think most of you don't possibly, that we were classmates at Rochester, actually. And uh, uh, we go a long way back and we do share a, you know, sort of uh, many, many, I would call sweet moments of our lives along with Ron Jones. And today we were discussing just before the start of the seminar. Karsten, uh, uh, as I can recall, has always been gifted with his ability to uh, communicate very well and very in a very sophisticated and polished manner, which actually you know, was quite evident when we were all starting our graduate uh, programs at Rochester. And, He's an outstanding teacher, and I think Ron always had a very, uh, you know, soft corner for for this erudite person. I would, I'm very very happy to be with him today today, and uh, and and his willingness to come and, and 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 present something, and I am not going to waste any more time. And so here is uh, here is Karsten for you. Thank you, Karsten. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Sugato. And uh, um, thank you so much for, for the, the, the kind welcome. Um, <clears throat> Sugato and I, uh, before starting here, we also reminisced about uh, a very, very cold winter at Rochester when we were uh, there together. And uh, it is almost coming full circle that we are now having a record uh, setting cold here in the Northeast. And uh, <clears throat> my heating system decided to, to take a break. Uh, just uh, just uh, this weekend. Uh, so I am sitting here bundled up uh, and it is uh, um, it is very cold here. Um, I uh, have asked uh, uh, you you uh, you have the the slides so if you want to uh, to uh, promote the slides when I lift my hand, we could do that uh, perhaps or or, uh, uh, so Shugato, I don't know how you're, uh, um, how you want to do that. I I do not have control. I think there there would be somebody who can do that for you. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, yeah. Yes. So you just wave the hand, and I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do, do that. So, you know, because uh, yeah. I, I I you you offered to do that, and I'm happy to take you up on that. Uh, so uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> This is a picture we have seen uh, earlier today. It's a lovely photo of, of, of Ronald Jones, uh, who uh, was the uh, 
teacher and uh, and uh, advisor of uh, of several of us, uh, 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 as uh, Professor Khan said earlier, uh, taught all of us and uh, was uh, advisor of Shugato, uh, Rick Bond, myself, uh, and and others. Uh, and um, if we go ahead, um, this is just an outline of what I would uh, uh, want to say, but uh, let me just uh, pause on this uh, slide here for a moment. Um, um, I thank you, uh, uh, Reverend Savio and uh, Sugata for the uh, for this conference, and uh, as uh, uh, and for inviting me. Um, I uh, was very struck uh, by the the objective of St. Uh, Etavius College uh, to make the highest quality education accessible to minorities and to talented students from poor and marginalized communities. Um, as I was uh, reflecting on, on that and on my remarks for uh, um, for today, it all struck me how uh, how much R Ron uh, Jones would appreciate uh, uh, such uh, objectives. Um, he, uh, as we got to know him uh, over the years, uh, really was very. Uh, he was very serious about his students. He was very uh, concerned uh, about his students. He, he took care of his students. And he was very pleased uh, that uh, his students came from many nations and many backgrounds. Um, and I think this was one of the many, many ways in which uh, Ron, uh, Ron Jones was ahead of his time. Um, he would practice diversity, equity, inclusion uh, at a time when these were not terms, words that were spoken widely. We all hear, uh, read these words today, but he practiced it. And uh, we are, I think, all very grateful uh, for that. And um, Ron was eloquent. Uh, he was a wonderful writer. And he was a, an amazing practitioner. So I'd like to emphasize this point because there are uh, things about Ron that only, I think, that in particular, we who had the privilege of knowing him for many years uh, uh, would, uh, would be aware of. Now, by celebrating, uh, and I need to be careful with my hands now because I do uh, like to speak with my hands as well and, <laughs> and having agreed with, the, uh, with his uh, tech, tech, uh, tech staff that waving my hands would mean that you would progress uh, um, the slides, so let's, uh, I, I'll, I'll try to be a little more careful with waving, but we're good here. So by celebrating uh, the 50, 50 years of the specific factors model, not only do we celebrate 50 uh, years of uh, two publications, um, but we honor uh, not two, but three great economic scholars and teachers. Um, certainly for, uh, for us uh, today, it's particularly uh, meaningful uh, uh, to, to be here talking about uh, the specific factors model in, con in the con context of and connection with Ron. Um, just passed passed away after a, a long illness, uh, but um, 
uh, but we also um, we also uh, uh, honor uh, Paul Samuelson and uh, and Charlie Kindleberger and uh, Samuelson and Kindleberger were Ron Jones's teacher uh, teachers and um, as you can see from the uh, um, from the first uh, citation, uh, Ron's paper uh, it was published in an, in an, in an uh, volume in honor of, of Kindleberger. So uh, we have three names of three amazing, distinguished uh, um, international economics uh, professors. And um, if we can go to the, and here we have Paul Samuelson, um, his office at MIT. Um, so one of our intellectual grandfathers. And uh, if we can go to the next uh, picture and there is Charlie Kindleberger. Um, Lovely photo as well, and he was uh, he was also a professor at MIT. And um, if you would go to the next photo, there you have the family tree, and uh, it's not even a complete listing of all uh, uh, Ron's students. But you see here, this is Alan Deardorff's uh, uh, academic uh, family tree for trade economists. And you see Samuel, uh, Samuelson Solo and Kindleberger uh, being the uh, the uh, advisors of, of Ron. And uh, for the students, you have Shogato Marjit, you have Eric Bond, uh, and you have uh, many uh, distinguished uh, um, e e e economists. Uh, and again, this list is not uh, complete because. Uh, uh, if you, oh, sorry, can you move back? Uh, yes, thank you. Because there are some, uh, there are now also some criteria uh, added that I think leave some uh, well-known uh, people off this list. Uh, if you, thank you. For all three of these scholars, practical concerns were key to their work. Um, they were keen observers of the world, of people, and they cared about social issues. And, and let me let me make emphasize this point, uh, which I think at, is 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 easily overlooked, uh, not least when it comes to. Uh, Ronald Jones's work. Um, Ron's writings, um, his scholarly writings, are, um, I think, almost exclusively on production. Um, and later in my presentation, I will. Uh, uh, I will suggest that when we teach international trade and uh, um, it, it becomes, <clears throat> I think for, for, for some students, it becomes, uh, it, 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 there's so much about technology, machinery, that at times it's like the human dimension disappears. And uh, of course, advanced economists will appreciate that these are uh, technology, capital and so forth are ways of transferring um, human activity uh, from one person or one group of people to another person or another group of people, but in, 
in the more, uh, say, compared to other disciplines, game theory, uh, consumer theory, so forth and so on, it can be uh, become a little uh, sort of a cold, um, or a little too indirect, if you if you want, uh, and. Um, But they looked at, and Ron looked at, uh, at economics as a social science. It was about people. To talk about the practical concerns, Charles Kindleberger is often called and, and was a leading architect of the Marshall Plan. I mean, an absolutely astounding uh, economic uh, effort, political effort, back in the late 40s. Paul Samuelson was the author of the world's premier economics textbook and had a very strong belief in making economics accessible. And Ron Jones was co-author, as was pointed out by others, with Richard Caves, later with Jeff Frankel, of the world's preeminent undergraduate international trade, uh, econ international economics textbook, world trade and payments. So like Samuelson, Ron Jones believed in the power of teaching economic theory to many, and he did it by delving deeply into general equilibrium economics which was the new and exciting field area of economics when Ron launched his uh, career. Now, the problem with uh, general equilibrium economics at that time, and you know, I hesitate to say this in front of uh, Professor Kahn, who is, uh, of course, one of the leading general equilibrium economist theorists that we. We've had the, you know, we have the privilege of of, of having, but the uh, problem with some of the early uh, work is that, of course, anything can happen in these uh, very large, complicated, and beautiful models. So the question um, became, you know, what can uh, we uh, use this? Uh, modeling framework paradigm for beyond showing uh, existence of equilibrium and that uh, uh, the free, tra uh, free trade is uh, Pareto optimal or put it in sort of less economic uh, language, less economic uh, terminology that uh, Adam Smith's competitive markets are logically consistent and that uh, these markets, if allowed to operate uh, uh, un, uh, unimpeded and will have attractive welfare properties. And Ron Jones uh, decided to try to make it, that whole paradigm accessible and useful by, as I wrote here, inventing quote unquote writing and giving amazing lectures on low dimension trade models in particular two by two by two which really offers this as a tool to people as a way of thinking economics, back of the envelope if you want, or in our, in our heads as we are uh, facing, presented with, with, uh, with various uh, uh, questions, policy exercises and so forth. And what I uh, think is fascinating about this approach is that once you have worked with this approach, this general equilibrium approach um, and comparative statics that Ron uh, introduced to us, it becomes very difficult to imagine why one would do partial equilibrium economics. Because when you uh, do partial equilibrium, you stand there and you talk about a market. And then of course, anyone will ask, well, what about the other market on the others, the other markets? And, you know, aren't there spillovers? Are there, aren't there connections and so forth and so on? 
And of course, uh, um, partial equilibrium might say, well, you know, it's a very, very small market, but students or people who are not economists will say, yeah, that's very good. But there are some markets that are not small. There are some goods that really matter uh, to other markets and so forth. And um, so that's sort of a strange and, and sounds like a very extreme approach. And uh, so once you start working with, uh, with the uh, uh, comparative statics of bronze, you, uh, you uh, find it very natural and very easy. And uh, one of the points I want to, to argue is that that approach and, and, uh, and that, um, yeah, uh, and that approach is, is, is one that really should be probably introduced much earlier in economics training and um, could have very um, uh, helpful implications also for getting um, people better equipped with uh, economic tools. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So I've taught international trade to diplomats and others who uh, are often involved in strategic uh, practical issues around trade and uh, uh, sort of a little bit of the family tree as well. Samuelson taught uh, at Fletcher for a year and Kindleberger was a, a visiting professor uh, for a number of years. And um, in teaching trade, um, I have come to believe that international trade theory uh, as expressed by the models um, and the way we usually do it in international trade course by not addressing income distribution from trade liberalization head on. It's, it's unusual when you look at trade texts. I say unusual, I'm not saying it's never done, but it is unusual that it's carefully uh, discussed, and I think it uh, fails to help practitioners address this important issue of uh, the winners and losers, uh, and that perhaps there is uh, too much time spent on questions of whether trade is good or not at all. And um, um, so it becomes, I think, a somewhat um, um, polarized debate instead of uh, uh, getting uh, a bit more to the uh, these distributional issues and looking harder at those may be helpful for for moving things forward and as I mentioned here two of the two best known models the Ricardian model and the Hexerlin model either ignore distribution issues because all workers are the same in the standard model. And it, it, we all know that there are variations and, and uh, hybrid models and so forth and so on. What I'm talking about here is the first pass at these, uh, at these uh, approaches. So the Ricardian model ignores it and the Hexerlin model on distribution uh, with the uh, Stolper Samuelson result the problem with that is that it is not easily accessible. So let me uh, show what I mean by that. Uh, my, my suggestion is that specific factors model can address this problem and uh, that perhaps specific factors model would be a useful place to start when we, when we do international trade economics. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to even suggest further that the specific factors model is so attractive, so intuitive to use that even students from other areas of economics and even perhaps other disciplines and not just students, but scholars and people who have not um, uh, vested a considerable time in economics might find it easy to use. And um, I think at this time, 
when there are so many voices on so many issues from so many disciplines talking about political, economic, social issues, it might actually be helpful if there were some common uh, language, if this language is robust. And I think the specific factors model is in many, many ways robust um, to various, you know, whether people come from anthropology, sociology, and so forth. So uh, let me uh, propose precisely what, uh, what I mean here. Uh, if we go to the next slide, there we go. So obviously the Ricardian model, we know why that's so important. It was the first to show comparative advantage. There's perfect mobility between sectors. There is exclusive focus on technology. Workers are identical, but no income distribution issues. And there is something else also, and that is, and this is some of these, what I'm setting up here are things that we really appreciate and enjoy as trade economists. But um, uh, because we've been through it, we remember ourselves when we saw this the first time, hmm, that's sort of odd and that's amazing. And but but for newcomers to economics, to international economics. Some of this is, uh, um, is, is a little puzzling and may or may not be helpful for, uh, for, for uh, I think, for the ability to communicate uh, across uh, um, different uh, groups of people with different backgrounds. Small shocks may lead to large shifts. Corner solutions abound in the Ricardian story. And uh, I wrote at the end, which is sort of provocative, but uh, uh, you, uh, you may or may not agree here, but I think previous economics training and concepts are not necessarily very helpful. Um, I'm certainly thinking rigorously, thinking carefully, it's always helpful, but the things you learned in your uh, microeconomics and so forth and so on does not easily carry into these conversations on the Ricardian model. If we take the next slide, please. Then we have the Hexel-Lean model. And now we do have distribution, of course, uh, income distribution. Uh, and now supplies matter, uh, um, or may matter, uh, supplies of factors as well as technology. But the uh, comparative statics uh, to which Ron, of course, uh, uh, contributed greatly, um, say the Stolper Samuelson theorem, and this is really uh, not intuitive, right? Ratios matter, Stolper Samuelson, Rybczynski, the Rybczynski theorem, ratios matter. So you have to look at this from above which is very powerful once you get it. You know, what I mean by above is looking at this system, this economy top down, which is a very, very powerful uh, way to do things, tremendously enlightening, um, but it doesn't sort of easily come from the ground up, unfortunately, right? All, everything that you learned about marginal analysis has sort of, mm, that's not really helpful. And we've all taught uh, these uh, these uh, uh, these models. Uh, Rick Bond, Shogato, uh, um, Professor Khan, and many many others. And it's uh, we know that people are, are 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 sitting there puzzled a bit. Can we go to the next one? Thank you. And then of course we have compared uh, imperfect competition. Um, and uh, now, obviously that's a very good step towards what we see a lot of. Uh, and, uh, but now again, we have small shocks, mainly to large shifts and uh, fundamental principles become difficult to get by when it comes to policy. Um, policy interventions may depend on minute differences. For example, you to use tariffs or subsidies may depend on whether policies are at valorum or specific or whether competition 
is Cournot or Bertrand. If we could take the next one, please. Uh, and uh, we have supply chains, trade and intermediate goods. And there, um, actually Ron again was, was, uh, was ahead of the times with his uh, work on fragmentation. Um, and, uh, but here we get this tension now between comparative and absolute advantage. So again, as someone uh, presenting the, uh, the, the plethora, if you want, the, the, uh, the menu of international trade economics models, um, we make this big deal out of comparative advantage and um, the sort of secret handshake of international trade economists. And now suddenly absolute advantage is the big deal. And um, students are like, okay, all right. So how key is that comparative advantage concept? And, uh, you know, the world is what it is and we have to deal with what it throws at us. Um, perhaps part of the problem here is that we're focusing so much on explaining trade flows and uh, perhaps focusing a little less on the power of some of these models. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we've talked about uh, we talked about this. Um, it's uh, um, the applications of the specific factors model are very rich, and including improved technology, Dutch disease, regional economics, transportation economics, economics of education. Uh, health and vaccines. Um, and uh, one issue there, disadvantage or con about the specific factors model is that comparative advantage is rarely discussed. Either it's trivial, specific factors, more of a specific factor automatically gives comparative advantage, or we need functional forms or more information at least with a mobile factor. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that the specific factors model should perhaps be taught in economics courses, not just in international trade courses uh, or in labor economics courses. Uh, labor economists like the bucket diagram. I don't have time to put that up here, but um, the bucket diagram, uh, basically two labor markets put together, two separate labor markets put together um, uh, in, in, in one uh, diagram. Um, but beyond that, beyond that, um, we should probably use these models and in particular specific factors model for other purposes. If we go to the next one, next slide, please. There we are. Uh, go back one, just sorry, let me just go back to. So it's an excellent framework for considering different kinds of capital, for example, transportation. Uh, at the end of my slides, I have a list of, of, of suggested readings. Um, the specific factor model allows to focus on different kinds of capital particular transportation issues. It generalizes to many sectors as Jones and Kierskowski and Sugata uh, 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 Margit has shown. Foreign investment is dealt with very nicely. Uh, the beauty is you can isolate one sector and then uh, and look at the effects there. If we go to the next slide, please. So I'm so sorry to be interrupting, but uh... We, we are running very short of time, so um, if you could. Let me, I'll, I will conclude uh, by saying that uh, some very interesting recent work in labor economics uh, is, uh, is um, uh, with David Card, um, uh, could benefit from looking, uh, using the specific factors model. 
and uh, uh, where we're seeing monopsonistic uh, tendencies in labor markets and the specific factors model can easily be uh, generalized to looking at monopsony in some sectors and not in others. And uh, finally, we can look at job specific issues. So workers cannot move between firms, they're stuck in firms. So not sector specificity, but job specificity. And uh, my final remark, my final remark is uh, that there's a lot of talk about complex systems, networks, and so forth in the final slide, if you show the final slide. Um, if you could go one more, to go to one more slide, thank you. And uh, of course, when people talk about networks now, and there's talk about complex systems, the general equilibrium economics are networks, they are complex systems, and the work by Ron was an attempt and has helped us understand the economics of these complex systems and of networks. So people who work on these environment in these environments, these frameworks would find this work helpful as well. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, for uh, uh, offering this uh, wonderful celebration of Ron Jones. Thank you, Garsten, again, for a very lucid and very, uh, I think, insightful uh, observations on specific factor model. In fact, I liked the last part that you said about how to think of mobility of workers between farms. And Ron's idea was still very much important in understanding when there are job-specific immobilities associated. And I think it's a very interesting point that you have raised. Uh, unfortunately, our time, uh, you know, stringencies do not permit us to have any other question, but I think uh, one thing we should just announce that since all the uh, presenters, you know, their, their, their uh, emails and everything are available, and I'm almost, I'm confident they'll be very happy to, to sort of look into some of the questions if you want to ask them directly later. So I think uh, we can relegate those questions for, for uh, eventual communications. Thank you, Karsten. And uh, thanks again. And uh, now off to Nirupama and uh, Shomo for the next session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Majid, for chairing this lecture. And thank you, Professor Kowalczyk, for delivering it. Uh, reviewing the textbook trade models in detail will definitely help us gain a better understanding on this subject. Also, thank you, Professor Kowalczyk, for detailing late Professor Jones' contributions to the field, while also highlighting what a stalwart he was. Our final lecture for today is on labor market polarization and the great urban divergence. Sharing this lecture is Professor Ajitava Rai Choudhury, and it will be delivered by Professor Donald Davis. Donald R. Davis is the Ragnar Narks Professor of Economics at Columbia University. He has taught at Harvard University before joining Columbia's faculty in 1999 and was appointed Chair of the Economics Department in 2001. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata, I would like to extend you a warm welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing us with your presence. This lecture is being chaired by Professor Ajitava Raichodhari. Our esteemed chair, Professor Ajitava Rai Choudhury, is currently the Professor Emeritus at Adamus University and has served as a professor in the Department of Economics, Jadavpur University, since July 1998. Professor Rai Choudhury obtained his PhD from the American University, USA, and has also visited the Yale University as a Fulbright Scholar. His areas of specialization are trade and development issues facing the developing countries, and macroeconomics. Professor Rai Choudhury has been a visiting faculty member of the Economics Research Unit, Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and the University of Calcutta. Sir, we are honored to have you with us today. On behalf of St. Xavier's College, 
Thank you, Professor Rai Choudhury, for chairing this lecture. I now call upon you, sir, to take this lecture forward. Well, thank you, um, Nirupoma, for giving a very generous introduction to both myself and Professor Davis, who is the center of attraction now for the last uh, speech, in fact. And uh, although I haven't met uh, Professor Davis personally, but I'm uh, somewhat, uh, you know, uh, have uh, uh, used, uh, in a sense, have some idea about his work because I use them in my teaching in some way or other, especially in industry trade or uh, uh, mystery of excess trade, uh, the, the trade balance, in fact. That is an interesting article. And now I guess he's more concerned with economic geography especially polarization in skills and uh, rise of uh, the big cities and decline of the small cities, et cetera. Very much you, you know, so important for developing countries too, in which we are interested, especially with the so much high, you know, large amount of unorganized sector, large amount of skill differences. And the polarization is there in a different form maybe, but that's happening in our part of the world too. So I'm really interested to hear what Professor Davis has to say about uh, the polarization and the work he's doing on basically economic geography and urban economics for quite some time. What do you, Professor Davis, we are all here to listen to what you say. Okay, thanks so much. I'm gonna share the screen to start. Uh, uh, you can see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so let me just say the work that I'm gonna talk about today is joint work with uh, Eric Mangus, and Tomasz Mikulski of, um, uh, of uh, HSC outside of Paris. Uh, so let me, oops, let me just make sure that it doesn't seem to be moving. Let's see if it does now. Hold on. Ah, okay. So let me, let me start, uh, you know, since this is a um, conference about specific factors model, uh, and also uh, honoring Ron Jones. Uh, let me say a couple of things uh, about Ron Jones. One is that I seem to have known him before I knew him. Uh, and I know that that's going to offend the theorists here. Um, uh, uh, oops, are you? It, uh, okay, can you see the movement of the screen? No. No? It's stuck somewhere. Possibly. Oh, okay, let me try and figure out what's going on with that. You can My go problem. to the read mode. Yes, it's working now. It's working it now. I'll, I'll just leave it this way. So yeah. I, I knew, uh, Professor, uh, I knew Ron Jones before I knew him, uh, basically because my advisors were Ron Findlay and Jagdish Bhagwati. Uh, so I was immersed in the MIT style low dimensional models. And uh, I, I feel like uh, his 1965 paper in particular sort of clarified a lot of economics for me. Uh, and I think that you know, that's something beautiful and that's something that carried forward in his work. And for me, it's wonderful to be here with some old friends, but it's always something where the most exciting thing is to be having the opportunity to talk to especially younger people, people who are maybe working on the PhD, people who are going to work on a PhD, people who uh, might be assistant professors and so on. And the reason why I tie this back to, to Ron is essentially Ron was a revolutionary. Uh, he wanted to pull forward things, uh, to you know, take economics where it was and to um, uh, begin to take it to a new place. Um, and I think that when we look back, we can look back with admiration. But if he were here today uh, in starting his career, absolutely, he would be thinking about what is the next step. Um, and uh, you, know, you can see that through his work. But the next step, you know, 50 years ago or, or 60 or more years ago, isn't the next step today. And so uh, I think that one of the things that that takes us to is simply that uh, we always need to be thinking, how is the world changing in a way that, uh, that will help us to know what are the important problems to look at? What are the important, uh, you know, whether we're thinking about data, whether we're thinking about theory, and how does the nature of the problems that we go after 
change as there's evolution both within the profession and in the world. Um, and I would, you know, I would sort of hold out that one of the dramatic changes uh, that has happened uh, in the last half century is really the role that data plays. Not, not only as, oh, let's get some data and test a theory, but that the data helps to tell us what are sort of the theories worth bothering to try and write down. And when I think back to Ron's work, I think not so much about its low dimensionality, that was certainly a feature of it, but rather that it was a low dimensionality that was trying to seek the simplest general equilibrium model adequate to the problem that he was, that he was interested in. And you know, he was happy to make things more complicated in order to uh, sort of uh, go after, you know, what are the general features here? Uh, and again, you can think of Jones and Shankman, uh, you can think about it as new kinds of problems. How do we think about trade with middle products, with intermediates? Um, and I think that uh, that spirit of always reaching forward, of, you know, sort of uh, appreciating the beauty of what's been done, but always looking forward and thinking about the frontier is the spirit that Jones had. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'm going to be talking about an urban regional model. Um, and uh, again, uh, as was mentioned, I've moved from uh, you know earlier in my career is really focused on trade problems per se, and more recently, uh, slippery slope to economic geography, urban you know regional urban problems, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And actually, urban within the cities. And one of the things that I've found is that the same intellectual framework, general equilibrium, people thinking about, you know, sort of exchange across space with or without factor mobility is actually, you know, the same models are extremely relevant for thinking about regional problems and also for thinking about what's happening inside of cities. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an apostate here having sort of stopped working quite so much on trade and having worked at these, you know, sort of more granular uh, geographic levels. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, again, for the younger people, I think that a lot of the questions become even more interesting as you do that. Uh, so that's going to be my pitch in general for uh, taking these kinds of models and applying them to problems, both across regions within a country or across cities, and also across uh, areas within a city. So let me just say, you know, the specific factors model, we're, we're all familiar with it. it. It really was, you know, at least in terms of the within country stuff, it's a kind of regional model. You know, the factors are land, which is basically thinking about rural areas, capital, thinking about cities, and a mobile factor that can move between them and thinking about urbanization. When you think about canonical urban systems, it's actually very close. You have uh, two or more cities, uh, and you know they also, in spite of the fact that they're cities, land actually is an important aspect of it because that's going to be a source of congestion costs, and there are going to be differences across the cities. But there's going to be a mobile factor. Traditionally, that's labor. And they think about why the cities have different sizes. And, uh, and the congestion arises not because of the traditional diminishing marginal productivity that you would think about in agriculture, but rather because land itself is heterogeneous within the city, or there's a fixed amount of it, depending on which kind of model you're doing, um, you know, what kind of internal structure there is. Um, but that sort of gives the diminishing returns that makes the canonical urban system a specific factors model. Uh, as Karsten was urging, I should mention, actually, Karsten was a really kind. Uh, we wrote a junk paper uh, early in my career. Uh, and I'll just uh, gently say that uh, most of the contribution came from him. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Karsten. Uh, but as he was mentioning, one of the things that makes uh, it interesting to be able to take models to the real world is to think about heterogeneity. And here it could be heterogeneity across cities, but especially to be thinking about heterogeneous labor. And in thinking about this, I'll mention 
Uh, the work of MIT's Arno Costino is somebody who really is sort of, uh, in some ways I think of as a next step uh, past these other models. In, in some ways, what he did, uh, and I'll mention is a Conometrica 2009 paper um, uh, in which he deals with a Ricardian model and a heterolane type model of trade uh, that uh, he asks, what additional restrictions do we have to have to be able to work with trade with a couple of locations or possibly many locations, but with a continuum of either different uh, labor types uh, or uh, different productivities. Um, and I think that that's extremely valuable work and has inspired the kinds of modeling that, I, that we're gonna be looking at here. Um, uh, uh, the difference is that we're gonna, he was looking again at a trade model in which uh, there, um, people can't move across the location. So it's a very conventional trade model. We're gonna be in a regional model where people can move anywhere that they want. And so some features of what he has in terms of his modeling, uh, assumptions about the distribution of different uh, kinds of labor across locations, in particular log, log supermodular distributions so that uh, some locations have relatively more of more skilled people is rather going to be an endogenous outcome rather than an exogenous outcome. But let me uh, move uh, more directly to what, what I'm gonna do in this paper. And unfortunately, this is gonna move really fast because it's impossible to cover everything. We're gonna talk about labor market polarization and I'm sure that you're familiar with it, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, that means decline in middle paid jobs and a simultaneous growth in low and high paid jobs. You see it in the US, you see it in lots of European countries, including the UK and France, there's vast literature. And we're gonna be thinking about this, but we're gonna think about it in a, in a regional context with many cities. When there's aggregate polarization, what happens in the different cities? Uh, and we're thinking here about the heterogeneity of cities that we're interested in is cities of different size. Now that's, uh, it, you know, in some sense, we're trying to drag the literature about the great urban divergence, which is about aggregate phenomena into understanding regional phenomena and really cross-sectional phenomena uh, looking across cities of different size. So we're gonna document some key facts not a, explained by the, the existing labor market polarization theories. And then we're gonna develop what we think of as as simple of a general equilibrium model as we could write down that accounts for our facts. So this is the canonical thing. You see this from Otter and Dorn. And basically at the low end, you see a growth of occupations that have really low wages, uh, sort of where the skill percentile is the percentile of the wage distribution, growth at the high end and declines in between. Now, I talked about labor market polarization, the great urban divergence. The great urban divergence is something else. Notice this has nothing about cities, but the great urban divergence is something that was noticed by Moretti, by Ed Glazer uh, and others, which is that uh, looking across time, uh, cities that start out with relatively high skills, here is me measuring it as college education, become relatively more skilled over time. Rather than converging in recent decades, cities have been diverging and trying to, yes, this is clearly a cross-sectional thing uh, to want to understand. Um, and the question is, how does that fact, labor market polarization, fit with this fact, the greater urban divergence, that they're becoming less alike? Okay, so, it's important to think about this, you know, to have some intellectual organizing framework. Now mention, uh, Asimoglu and Otter talk about it in their uh, Handbook of Labor Economics chapter. And they basically really go after two factor models. You can think of as following on Katz Murphy that emphasize sort of uh, skill bias, technical changes, uh, explaining evolution of the uh, skill premium. Uh, and in particular, what they say is, look, if you only have two factors, you can't even begin to think about polarization, growth at the low and high end, 
and shrinkage of jobs in the middle. Uh, it just can't be done. You really need to have at least three things that people are doing to even get that conversation started. And in particular, it's important that the uh, great urban divergence has been discussed up to now only in two-factor models. That is the models that inherently can't explain labor market polarization. So we have two important phenomena that simply inherently can't be put in the same framework yet. And that's and so we're going to be trying to uh, uh, generate a framework, but we want to be guided by the prominent features in the data to know what that framework should look like. So I'll just mention that you know sort of the prominent hypotheses about labor market polarization is that it's either offshoring. So some of these jobs that used to be done one place are now done in China or India or Mexico or wherever you want. Uh, so it's offshoring. The other is routinization. So substituting computers for labor. And those are seen as potential mechanisms. In what we're doing, those are gonna uh, appear similar. Uh, so let me talk about the key facts. The first one is we're gonna be talking about France. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, it, uh, I realize that uh, we're not in France today, we're in Calcutta. Um, uh, but I think that sort of the mechanics may still be of interest. So the first question is this. We know that labor market polarization is happening in the aggregate. Does it happen everywhere? Is it the same everywhere? Okay. And you know, just mention that Otter and Dorn, who wrote about this, uh, their model actually doesn't give rise to polarization. So trying to figure out quite how to understand it across locations is not something that's trivial. So it is true just to say that in the underlying data about France, there is labor market polarization. The, don the circles there are particular occupations. Ones that are low are ones that are declining. Uh, it's especially uh, skilled and unskilled industrial workers, uh, sort of mid-level professionals, uh, uh, supervisors, foremen, and to a certain extent, office workers are declining. Uh, skilled uh, engineers and uh, sort of high-level uh, uh, sort of managers are growing at the high end and at the low end, it's service, it's transport, it's personal services, retail, that kind of thing that's growing. So we want to ask, uh, so the first question we wanted to ask was, is it happening everywhere? So I'm going to give you a, uh, a diagram that has cities and shows in percentage points, it's going to be an XY diagram. Uh, X axis is in percentage points, what happened to middle paid jobs. If they decline, you guys see the data on the left. On the Y axis is in percentage points, what was the growth of high paid jobs? And so the question is in this diagram, uh, so middle, you know, sort of with three groups and percentage points, they have to add up to zero. And so uh, where, where will you find labor market polarization? And we're used to talking about quadrants, but let's talk about octants. And so the fourth octant represents labor market polarization. And there's the data. Out of 117 cities in France, 115 uh, have polarization. You might look at that and go, ah, well, you know, that just tells me that uh, uh, it's happening everywhere. Why is that interesting? Well, the next question becomes, well, one is we didn't have a model that, that uh, explains that. Uh, and two is you can also ask, okay, so it's happening in all cities, 115 of 117, but is it happening the same everywhere? Okay. And uh, are the systematic patterns, are the ones, are the cities that are initially most exposed middle paid jobs also where the sharpest declines are. And again, by hypothesis, there's a common shock, routinization or offshoring, but the economic structure of the cities differs. And, and uh, so it doesn't have to be that it uh, affects everywhere the same. So let's see what happens. I, we already saw this. Uh, there's labor market polarization happening everywhere. Notice that above the dashed line, you have greater high paid job growth and uh, below the dashed line, you have greater low paid job growth. Where are the big cities? There they are. And what you can see is that the big cities actually were the ones where middle paid jobs got crushed furthest. 
if you put the middle paid jobs in there, they got crushed less, but still more than the low paid, which are the black dots. Um, and so the answer to the question, is it uniform across locations is no. Uh, big cities got hit much harder in terms of the loss of middle paid jobs. And those middle paid jobs got replaced for the most part with high paid jobs. And this sort of summarizes that. It's broken from left to right into low paid, middle paid, and high paid. And the different colors are the sizes of the cities. And notice that the big contrasts are that in the middle paid jobs, it was the big cities that lost a lot. And they're also the ones where they uh, got lots of new high paid jobs. That's the big contrast. Next question, I'll just mention uh, Otter, Dorn, and Hansen have a prominent paper that says, well, the ones that are going to get affected most are those most exposed to middle paid jobs. If you look at all middle paid jobs in the French data, this is wrong. Uh, and in particular, it's the places that were least exposed, the big cities, Paris, Lyon, Marseille, et cetera, et cetera, that were least exposed to the middle paid jobs in fact, had the highest loss of these jobs, both in percentage points and a fortiori in percentages. Um, the next thing is, let's think about which of these middle paid jobs you're losing, because that may help us to distinguish between models. Uh, so we've, we've already, um, we're gonna think about this in a model in which there's heterogeneous labor getting sorted into uh, sort of a different tasks, low, medium, and high paid. And that's going to give us two margins of who's participating in which sector. The shock is going to be that the returns of being the middle paid sector are going to decline. How is the adjustment going to happen? Well, we've already seen this picture. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna leave uh, sort of the low paid and the high paid unchanged and divide up the middle paid according to the median wage. So we get two tiers of middle paid jobs and see where the big adjustments are and what the contrasts are. That's here. And basically what it tells us is uh, that the big decline in middle paid jobs and big contrast between large and small cities is that the large cities lost a lot of the jobs at the high margin and had growth of jobs at the high margin in relative terms. That's where the big changes were happening. Last thing, is a great urban divergence a feature of the French data. We can look at this for high skill employment in 94 and 2015. In 94, bigger cities had more commitment to high paid jobs. Same was true in 2015, but it was also diverging. The difference between them got larger over time. So indeed, in the French data, you do have the great urban divergence, just like in the US. Okay, so four key facts. Polarization was happening everywhere. Middle paid job loss was not where you were initially most exposed to it. There's skewed middle paid job loss. It's concentrated in the upper tier of middle paid jobs for the large cities, and in relative terms, the lower tier for small cities. And the great urban divergence is something that's featured. I now have uh, about eight to 10 minutes to explain the theory. Can existing theories explain our facts? I won't go into it. The answer is no, uh, for various reasons. So let me sketch the theory. We combine a theory of labor market polarization. that will take some basics from Otter and Dorn, and also from Cortez, who I mentioned, and marry this with a model of spatial equilibrium with heterogeneous agents based on some papers uh, with Chicago Booth's Jonathan Daigle, uh, which is model of heterogeneous labor, endogenous spatial sorting. So we have a, we're gonna have a continuum of labor and it, people can go anywhere that they want to, depending on what their returns will be. It's endogenously going to give rise to log supermodularity and skill distribution. That is, pick any two cities, any two skills, the larger city will have relatively more of the higher skill. Okay. The environment, two cities, uh, one larger in equilibrium. This can be generalized. Continuum of types with skills uh, omega in an interval, uh, three productive sectors. Uh, again, people can choose these things. Do you want to be in the high paid sector, the medium, or the low paid? 
Because obviously for individuals of heterogeneous skill, it won't always pay off to be in the quote unquote high paid sector. So individuals are gonna choose a city, they're gonna choose a sector, and they're also gonna choose a location within a city that's going to affect their productivity. And you can think of that either as, well, am I gonna end up with a long commute? Or you can think about having to pay inside of a city to be close to the center of a cluster where there's some productivity spillovers. And there's spatial equilibrium at zero cost. You know, there's a, you have to pay a cost to be in city and you have to pay a bigger cost to be in a more productive location in a city. What that's going to do for us is it's going to give us overlapping skill distributions. Uh, productivity for cities, we can endogenize these things, but we're just going to uh, put them from the outside. City one has higher aggregate PFP, and also city one is going to have some sectoral comparative advantages in high relative to middle paid tasks and middle relative to low paid tasks. It, it's straightforward to endogenize these things, uh, but it sort of makes our life easier to leave those as exogenous for now. There's going to be a final output produced and traded costlessly from the three intermediates plus this Z thing, which is either uh, a uh, offshore intermediate that you're now importing, or it's something subject to technological progress where it can, a Z is a substitute for middle paid labor, um, but uh, the composite middle paid activity is going to be a complement to low and high paid activities. And the only shock that's going to be happening is that the price of this uh, either capital or offshore input Z is going to fall. That's going to be the comparative static. Final output costlessly assembled and traded. Uh, I'm going to mention, so I did say there's cities uh, sector comparative advantage. It turns out that in our French data, we can use an about Kumar's Margolis framework to recover these. And indeed, the relative productivities are like that. Um, second, we can talk about productivities for individuals. Uh, so uh, individuals are going to have productivities that depend on the, their type, their sector, and their city, omega, sigma, and C. Um, and it's going to be logs modular in omega and sigma. That's again, you can think of it as compared to advantage across individuals. And T of tau is decreasing, again, reflecting the advantages of being in good locations within a city. And so within a city, higher skill people sort into higher skill sectors, uh, high omega people sort into higher skill sectors, they earn higher incomes. Um, and we're gonna have some additional restrictions on sort of skills cross sectors. And here's this. We're going to have sort of these three sectors, the low skilled, medium paid, and high paid. Uh, how does your productivity, your type omega, translate into productivity differences in each of these three things? We're going to assume that uh, it goes like this. Think of Albert Einstein and think of me. Albert Einstein has a higher omega. As a janitor, he would be more productive, but not a lot more productive than I would be. As a patent clerk, he would be quite a bit more productive than I would be. But as a theoretical physicist, he'd be off scale in productivity compared to me. We're going to interpret that as concave in the locate sector, translating differences in omega into productivity, linear in the middle paid, and convex in the high paid. It's a sort of uh, simplification of this. But basically, it's going to give rise to this kind of, for a given set of prices, of the various tasks, it's going to give rise to this kind of diagram. And based on your omega, you will uh, sort of sort into the upper contour of these factor returns. That'll tell you what sector to be in and sort of keep this diagram in mind because what's going to happen here, the only shock that's gonna happen is a P of M, the price of the middle paid task is going to fall because of the offshoring or the routinization shock. Okay. It turns out that if you, again, look in our data, it's not a crazy thing to think about at the low end translating skill into productivity. Here it's worker fixed effects, getting about from our Margolis framework, uh, 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 you know, concave, linear, convex. And we're sort of truncating that a little bit. It becomes even more convex. And a contrast between large and small cities 
uh, where uh, the comparative advantages are ever. Okay, so what are we going to get? What we're gonna get is that we have two cities. Just look at set, city one for a second. There's gonna be sorting. How mega people sort into the high skilled sector, medium or middle uh, omega people sort into the middle paid and the least skilled sort into the low paid. And similarly in city two, won't worry too much about, there is a truncation at the top end for the second city. I could talk about that, but won't. What's important here is the role that city level comparative advantage is playing um, in two dimensions. It's going to affect the static uh, distribution of what people do. And it's also going to affect, because of this, also the comparative statics that come out of this once you interact that with the thing, the individual level productivity by task thing that we just discussed. So let me note the first thing, which is because of city ones, which is the big city, comparative advantage in the high skill sector, the marginal person between high and middle is actually less productive in the big city than the small city. Why can they stay in the high skilled sector? Because of that comparative advantage. And similarly, there's going to be a similar ordering between the two, uh, between the two cities and the cutoffs uh, between the uh, middle and low paid sector. So it establishes comparative advantage is establishing an ordering of these cutoffs. That turns out to be crucial. Let's see why. Well, we, we've simplified a diagram here. Uh, so for a moment, just look at this is the returns in the middle paid sector. And in the big city, this is the returns in the high paid sector. Who is going to be in the high paid sector? Well, you're in the high paid sector if you're to the right of omega of H in one, and you're going to be in the middle paid sector to the left. We've sort of left off the low paid sector because that's where your returns are highest. And again, I've already mentioned that if we instead looked at city two, where there's lower productivity or low, weaker compared to advantage or compared to disadvantage in the, in the high paid sector, they're actually going to have a higher cutoff between high and middle. Um, and uh, so there's an, that I just said there was an ordering of cutoffs. What's the comparative static that we're going to look at? And the answer is that. Uh, uh, well, let me just tell you what the what result is going to deliver, and then let me show you a picture that illustrates that. Basically, we've set up a framework in which the only the only shock is a common decline in the returns of being in the middle paid sector, the price of the middle paid task. It's going to give rise to a big decline in uh, sort of who is participating. Uh, excuse me, in the margin between high and medium in the big city and a more modest decline in that margin between high and middle in the smaller city. And, and the reverse when we look at the boundary between low and middle. Why is that? Well, let's look at the picture. So we've already seen this picture. And what's the comparative stack? The comparative static is to pull this down. Why? Because pi sub z is falling. And so the returns of being in this middle paid sector falling. But notice something, that because of the uh, comparative advantage ordering, uh, giving rise to different cutoffs, notice that in the big city, it's on a more elastic portion of the, uh, of the uh, factor return curve. That is, it's going to crush middle paid people, uh, you know, a common movement in this uh, returns to the middle paid activity is going to give rise to less elastic response in the small city and more elastic response in the big city. And you can see it here. Uh, again, uh, more elastic response, less elastic response. And that would tell a reason why a common shock offshoring or uh, routinization that reduces the uh, sort of incentives to be in the middle paid sector is going to give rise to more loss of the middle paid jobs, but also then the flip side is gain of high paid jobs in the big city relative to the small city. 
Okay. So there's going to be a number of propositions looking at this. The first is universal labor market polarization. Basically, everybody is getting hit with the same shocks. They respond to two margins. It squeezes the middle paid sector. Very natural that everybody is responding to that by cutting back the number of middle paid jobs. But those, uh, there's going to be skewed middle paid job loss and reallocation. Uh, when the comparative advantage of the large city and the high paid sector is sufficiently large, then the large city, the decline in the middle paid jobs is larger in percentage points. The increase in high paid jobs is larger in percentage points. And the increase in low paid jobs in the big city is smaller in percentage points. And you get corollaries about the greater urban divergence, about uh, exposure. Share of high paid jobs increases in the large cities where they were already most abundant, that's a great urban divergence. And relative to Otter Dorn Hansen, initial exposure and middle paid job loss. In our case, the middle paid jobs decline most sharply in the large cities where they were initially, that should say, least abundant. Uh, so let me conclude. We've identified four key facts. Uh, universal polarization, meaning that it happens in the aggregate, and it happens in 115 of 117 cities. Middle paid job loss greatest in the large cities where exp exposure was initially lowest. Middle paid job loss is skewed, concentrated in upper tier of middle paid jobs in large cities and the greater urban divergence, high paid jobs grow fastest where they were initially most abundant. And again, sort of taking us back here, we have effectively, again, a uh, specific factors model. The specific factor is the location. It's the land there it's that you have to, and that the land inside of a city is heterogeneous. It's heterogeneous because you have to travel to work. It's heterogeneous because some places there are close to the center of clusters. You think Wall Street, you think Madison Avenue, you think the Silicon Valley, uh, that access matters. Um, and that effectively gives rise to diminishing returns. But we can have a whole continuum of skill types that are uh, sorting across locations in a way that actually in general equilibrium and high dimensions does it with fairly straightforward comparative statics. Uh, the model that we write down, it's a conditional one. We need uh, comparative advantage to be sufficiently strong. But if we posit that, then we can explain all of our key facts. And the interaction and the key to this, you know, lurking in there is interaction of absolute advantage, which give rise to cities of different sizes, and comparative advantage, both across cities that order is orders these cutoffs. And across individuals, um, what is sort of the ordering that that takes? Um, and I will leave it there. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Davis. Uh -huh. I guess uh, there were a couple of very quick questions which were asked by the students. And I guess uh, they always have you know, millions of things in their heads. Uh, if I can have uh, just two very quick questions, we're running short of time. Oh, sure, I'm I'm happy. Yes. Uh, one question is, uh, how do you think that labor market segmentation has an impact on global value chains? I don't know the name of the student who has asked it. If you can just uh, identify yourself, so people can know. So uh, uh, I, I would say that what we're doing here is sort of looking at the reverse side of it, which is if the global value chains. Right, so uh, some of the jobs are really hard to offshore, potentially, especially say the low skill service jobs. We're going through a period where we're going to have to find out whether there's a lot more of those high skill activities are offshoreable. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I actually, you know, uh, uh, sorry to blather on on this, but I will mention uh, that there's something that really requires a lot of work uh, so for those people who want new projects, and, and obviously there's work that's going on on it. But we know that, for example, in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of stress between employees and tech firms. The employees want to work in, in Mexico City, they want to work in Bali, they want to, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I think that the most important thing is you had better hope that you can't do that. 
Because if you can do that, the world has a lot of smart people in it. And guess what they had? They had monopoly access to the best labor market in the world. And suddenly, if it turns out that not, not work from home, work from home isn't the thing. If work from anywhere works, then it's game over for them because the extraordinary rents that they get by monopoly access to the most productive labor market is over. Um, and that would be, you know, for a place like India, that would be tremendously good news. Uh, if suddenly, you know, you can be equally productive by being very far and just occasionally visiting, uh, guess what? Uh, you know, for those, who, again, who have had that monopoly access, that's all over. So we'll see. Okay, uh, one another, there's last one. Do you think right. the high scale and low scale sectors are the outcome of credit market imperfections? Another student. So um, here we actually have competitive markets on everything. There are, because we're allowing for there to be TFP differences and, uh, and we're allowing for there to be other productivity differences with a pattern of comparative advantage, um, there are spillovers. So it's certainly not a perfect markets model. And you know, uh, here we're treating this as exogenous. Again, I have a couple of papers in the AER and the GIE for students who are interested with Jonathan Dingle at Chicago Booth. And there we endogenize at least some of that. We endogenize the TFP differences. Basically, if you're larger and you have a relatively more skilled workforce, in the log super modular sense, then you're going to have higher TFP. Now there's a lot of, given the log super modularity, you would think that that might also feed into comparative advantage um, very naturally. We don't actually work that out, but I don't think that that would be hard. Um, but uh, the, the short version again is we're very, uh, I'm really interested in thinking about imperfections in labor markets we don't have them here directly, except for the fact that there's externalities from the, the location choices. Well, uh, I guess we, uh, the organizers are, uh, want to keep the time uh, yeah. as much as possible within the schedule. But anybody can uh, send some questions to you. I guess you will be uh, interested to see how the students are reacting. So they can send you some questions over the Absolutely. email. Yeah. I mean, uh, that, that's a great opportunity for all of you. Uh, you have a, a professor like Donald Davis who is interacting with you and you should, uh, you know, uh, get the best out of it as much as you can. So I hand it over. Thank you, Professor Davis, again. It's a stimulating yeah, uh, to the organizers speech. For the I guess uh, there are lots of questions in mind of many of us, but yeah. let's leave it there. We can ask you again by email or otherwise. So yeah. it's a wonderful speech. I mean, it's really, it's uh, very thoughtful and very provocative. So with thank, this, I- Thank you so uh, much. And thank you to all the organizers. I really appreciate the invitation. Okay. I hand it over to the organizers again for wrapping up the whole discussion. Thank you, Professor Aichodri for chairing this lecture. And thank you, Professor Davis for the invigorating discussion. Your lecture on the highly relevant topic of labor polarization while highlighting the views of the late Professor Ronald Jones will indeed encourage our students to learn more about the arena of economic geography. Today's lectures have helped our audience gain a deeper understanding of the various facets of the specific factor model on Professor Jones's work in general and with a lot more clarity. We thank all our esteemed chairs and distinguished speakers, each of whom is a luminary in their own right, for taking time out of their busy schedules and making this session possible. Thank you. As we near the end of today's session, may I request the head of our department and IQAC coordinator, Dr. Partha Pratim Ghosh, to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you, Nirupoma. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to offer the closing remarks after today's online session. On behalf of the Postgraduate and Research Department of Economics and the Internal Quality Assurance Cell at St. Xavier's College, Autonomous Kolkata, 
I would like to express our deep appreciation for the distinguished speakers and chairs who have provided valuable contribution to this online session of our international conference titled Imperfect Resource Mobility and Economic Adjustments, celebrating 50 years of the specific factor model. Thank you, professors, for this wonderful opening session of the conference. Throughout the online session today, various facets of the specific factor model have been discussed by our esteemed speakers and chairs, highlighting the possibilities of using the specific factor model in real world scenarios and giving a lucid presentation of the varied works of one of the giants in international economics, Professor Ronald Winthrop Jones. We have witnessed thought-provoking lectures from luminaries across the globe, Professor M. Ali Khan from John Hopkins University, Professor Eric Bond from Vanderbilt University, Professor Karsten Kualtzig from Tufts University, and Professor Donald Davis from Columbia University. Their lectures were accompanied by valuable inputs from our esteemed chairs, Professor Noritsuju Nakanishi from Kobe University, Professor Shoyol Lahiri from Southern Illinois University, our very own Professor Shugato Marjit from the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, and Professor Ojitabo Rai Chudri from Adamus University. The invigorating online session today has indeed provided several new insights and more clarity regarding the applications of the specific factor model and the work of Professor Ronald Jones, setting the tune for the two more days of our international conference. I would especially like to thank our revered principal, Reverend Dr. Dominic Savio, SJ. Father, we are forever grateful to you for your constant support and guidance. I would also like to express my gratitude to the vice principals, deans, and faculty members of our department for their valuable guidance and support to our students in their attempt to organize this international conference. A very special note of thanks to the professors and students of the technical team and other teams for organizing this event. And we look forward to an equally insightful and invigorating second and third day of the international conference slated to be held at our college. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much, sir, for the closing address of this online session. With that, we have come to the end of today's proceedings. However, we look forward to an equally invigorating day two and day three of this international conference. Thank you everyone for making today's session of the international conference a success. We hope to see you tomorrow at the Park Street campus of St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. 